So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Fong, CF, your presenter today. We have uh, my co-host here, Lillian, Isabel, and Kane, um, to all to basically run the whole show. Now. Basically, I'm just focusing on pressing the button for my PowerPoint. Um, so we will have a chat, but chat features enabled on uh, on the chat features. You can, if you have any questions, feel free to type your questions, and then. Uh, Kane and uh, Isabel and uh, Lillian will be assisting me. So I'll be going on with the presentation and on and off, I'll be looking at the, the chat box uh, just in case I miss your questions, but don't worry, I'll be answering your question at the end of the presentation, right? So are we ready to, to start everyone? Yep. Let me just adjust this a little bit. So to respect everyone, we will start sharp on 10 a.m. Uh. So first of all, thank you very much for being um, punctual on time. Um, let me just mute my music first. My music is very distracting. You guys can hear the music, right? Uh, okay. Distracting. How about now? Okay. So today we are going to talk about compromise assessment. And more importantly, what is compromise assessment? So today we're going to share with you based on our experience in performing digital forensic and community crime investigation for the last more than 10 years, right? We'll share with you what is compromise uh, assessment about. And also more importantly, I believe some of our participants may have a questions about what does a regulator means by compromise assessment? What are the requirements the regulator wanted for compromise assessment? And also we were going to do our best to explain, to decode for you what the regulator wants. Again, we are not from the regulators. We are not from Bank Nigeria, but what we'll be doing is to give you the best understanding of what we know from the guidelines provided by Bank Nagara, all right? So before we start, I would like to ask everyone a question. Have you watched this movie before, Parasite? If you have, please raise your hand. I think there's a raise hand feature here, right? Um, I don't know how to use this. Uh, is there a raise hand feature here? You didn't? Uh, yes, it's under the reactions on the reaction. bottom bar. This reaction. Uh. You can raise your hand there, yeah. There are people raising their hand already. Mm -hmm. uh, just two person, three person, four, five. Three. I think ninety nine percent of the our participants should watch this movie. If you haven't watched this movie, I think Sylvie haven't watched this movie. You need to watch this movie. In fact, I watched it twice. All right, I watched it twice. Uh, the movie is very good, and the movie is very much related to the topic that we're going to talk today. Parasite. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the the. I think only a handful of people, only a few people, only. So I'm not going to spoil about the 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 story of the movie, but, but you have not watched this movie just yet, go and watch it. Uh, it's very, very uh, interesting. And it's very much related to our topic today, compromise assessment. Right, so um, let me just quickly do a quick introduction. Huh? All right, so today's presentation is brought to you by Asian Banking School and LGMS. So Asian Banking School is, is a reputable um, organization uh, that is providing talent building and also education for financial institutions. So we have a representative from Asian Banking School here today, uh, Sylvie, say hi. And Aris, Aris is, is, is here. And uh, it's, this uh, presentation also, is also organized by LGMS. It's a collaboration between LGMS and Asian Banking School. And in the months to come, Asian Banking School is also going to roll out quite a number of uh, training programs for financial institutions. So watch out for their emails and uh, and we, it's going to be very interesting. So we're going to partner with Asian Banking School to roll out uh, other training programs as well. So a very quick introduction about myself, all right? So I'm going to talk to you for the next uh, 60 minutes. So just let me do a quick intro first. Uh, my name is CF Fong. I'm the CEO of LGMS. LGMS is a cybersecurity testing assessment firm. We provide um, security assessment testing and digital forensic and computer crime investigations. So my interests... Uh, is in computer crime investigation and digital forensic. I came from a, a penetration testing background. I've been doing penetration testing for more than 20 years. And then um, along the way that I discovered my deep interest is actually in digital forensic. I also wrote a training program for PECB. Uh, the training program currently is now is used worldwide to teach uh, examiners to do digital forensic. Uh, so that's a little bit background about me. Lah. So I have a LinkedIn profile in case uh, you're interested to find out more. By the way, my LinkedIn profile is not that updated, by the way. So uh, in case you need to find out more, then you can check check me out. Um, let me see next. So LGMS, uh, what do we do? We are, basically, we are a testing firm. We provide security testing assessment. We specialize in different various type of testing. So today, we are not just testing on computer systems. We're also testing on uh, medical equipment, testing on IoT devices. We work with labs uh, in different parts of the world to 
to carry out testing. Another very interesting uh, activities that we do is computer crime investigation. We work with many financial institutions in the country to carry out computer crime investigation and digital forensic. We also serve as an incident response team for some of the major banks here to respond to their computer events. That's why some of these stories that I'm going to share with you later is going to be very related to the real cases that we have seen in some of these uh, financial institutions. Now, um, you see, may, most of the time when we when uh, these cyber attacks happen, right, we seldom see it appear on the news. We seldom see it appear on the on the mass media. There's there's a reason for it, uh, Because in Malaysia, we do not have any laws to mandate that all hacking cases must be disclosed, right? So that's why some organizations, when they suffer from a cyber attack, when they get hit by a cyber attack, right, organizations will typically will not disclose this to the public. However, being a frontliner like us, when we go to the crime scene, when we go there and assist the organizations to recover, to, to, to dig, dig deep into doing the investigation, we get to learn a lot of things from the bad guys, in fact. Right. In fact, this is the thing that I would like to emphasize. We learn a lot from the bad guys. We learn what are the tools the bad guys are using, what are the modules of brandy, how the bad guys actually infiltrate into the organization, what was a common reason why people got hacked, you know, what, what are the common methods the, the bad guys are using, how are the tools look like. Sometimes during the digital forensic investigation, we even able to uncover, you know, uncover the tools the, that was left over by the bad guys. So all of these things add up together, right? It gives us a very good learning. And we always will, will like to share this with our participants, with our client uh, when it comes to computer crime investigation and uh, training. And at the same time, what we have learned during this kind of um, uh, discovery, this kind of uh, computer crime investigation, we put this back into our testing process. That's why our testing process is very much relating to the real life scenario. When we carry out penetration testing for our customers, for our, for our client, we will apply back what we have learned from the bad guys to make it very realistic. And uh, so if you can pass through the test, means that your organization should be able to withstand the, the cyber attacks that's currently what is happening. So uh, this is something about us. We are also a joint venture operator for two cybersecurity labs. So this uh, cybersecurity lab is one of the um, lab that is operating outside. It's one and only lab that is operating outside of Europe that is providing cybersecurity testing, and we are one of the shareholders of this lab. So next slide. Yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about LGMS. I think more importantly, people are interested to know what are the compromise assessments. So before we start, I'm going to share with you uh, some real cases, real cases that happened in Malaysia, but when, was never even surfaced to the news, right? And this, there's a very, very important reason why we want to learn about these cases, because in order for us to be proactively knowing how to protect ourselves, right, we need to know how the bad guy works. How do they hack into organizations? What are the ways they used to hack in, right? So let's share with the first, uh, let's look at the first case study, All right? Uh, this is a financial institution. Uh, in fact, they are one of the major financial institution. Um, two years ago, they, have, they have, have suffered a major cyber attack. So by the time we got called in, right? Uh, the cyber attack already happened and then there are ransomware cases. Uh, the ransomware uh, spreading in the entire uh, institutions, financial institutions, uh, their branches are affected, uh, the HQ is affected, and then uh, it's quite uh, serious. So when we went in there, then we're starting to do our investigation. So uh, to cut it short, right, what we have found out is that um, when we went in there, we, of course, when we deploy our tools doing a, a survey and study, we realized that uh, actually there are multiple channels hackers can get into the bank. Okay, into the financial institution. I shouldn't even mention bank. Get into the financial institution. So one of the way that we discovered was that uh, the hackers actually using Team Viewer, right, and uh, to to go into the bank. But what is more shocking is that the hacker got into the bank for more than three years ago, right? This is one of the findings that we have discovered. Of course, at the same time, the financial institutions also engage their own antivirus vendor. They also engage a firewall vendor to do a correlation to do a discovery of the, the entire incident but everyone found different things. So what we found out is that the attackers actually hacked in through Team Viewer uh, into the bank more, for more than three years ago, all right? And then when we, dig, uh, when, we uh, this, when we look into the entire incident deeper, also we found out that the hack attackers, how they transport a ransomware from outside into the bank, bypassing the antivirus, bypassing the EDR, and then install the ransomware into the bank's uh, computers. And upon closer inspection also, we took a sample of the ransomware, we tear it apart, we started the source code of the ransomware. Now, when we, look, when we look at the code of the ransomware, we found even more shocking things, right? We found out that 
the IP address of the financial institutions uh, of the infrastructure was actually hard coded in the in the scripts that is being used. So meaning that the person or the organizations who hack into the financial institutions, they have spent enough time to study the financial institution architecture. So their attacks, the way how they bypass, the way how they evade antivirus are all tailor-made, customized to the financial institution, to the, to the, to the victim, right? The way how they uh, you jump do a lateral movement, moving from one point to another point, and the IP addresses, the address range, everything is customized uh, to the financial institutions, meaning that they've spent a lot of time studying, right? Studying the financial institution. And then eventually, uh, they launch a ransomware attack. You see, launching a ransomware attack is not something favorable for hackers, actually. To tell you the, the truth, right? Serious hackers, they will not launch ransomware attack. Serious hacker means that those hackers who wish to continue to stay persistent within your organizations, right? continue to steal information, continue to um, observe your workflow and see what they can exploit from the workflow. These hackers, these group of hackers normally will not deploy ransomware because by the time they deploy ransomware, right, you get to know already because your business get disrupted, your files get encrypted, you cannot work and then you get, you call, you, they expect you to call people in to assist you already. So normally for serious hackers, that what we see, uh, who are doing industrial espionage, they will not deploy in some way. They will stay persistently, quietly uh, within the organization that they hack in, right? Until to the point that they realize that, okay, there's not much of a value uh, remaining inside the organization, then they will deploy the ransomware. That's why in most of the cases that we have seen, right? Ransomware cases, ransomware attack to financial institutions, to uh, telecommunication operators, to ISP even, uh, those cases that we have been through, we have worked on directly, when you get hit with ransomware, usually that intrusion happened for quite some time already, meaning the hacker came into your environment for quite some time already before they deploy the ransomware. We will seldom see ransom straight away, hack, a hackers hack straight away, hack in and then start deploying ransomware, we, it, which is quite seldom, right? Hackers will try to do a lateral movement, move around within your network, study your network, and then they, before they launch the ransomware. Right. This is one of the things that we have learned. And this case happened for three years. And as a financial institution, you would have known that they have firewalls, they have antivirus, they have uh, deployed their EDR systems, they have SIEM, they have everything. But why hacker can still hack in? I'm going to share with you the answer later. Right. So another case. We have another case. Uh, this one is a logistic company. It's, it's, a, it's a huge logistic company. They have branches nationwide and they were compromised and... Uh, and this was, this, is, this was also very interesting. Uh, they have some, they have warehouses in, in a different part of the, the, con, con, the country. So one of the warehouse was compromised by attackers. Uh, the attackers hacked in through a remote desktop and from the warehouse, the attacker moved itself up to uh, the HQ. Now, what we have learned in this case was the attackers also do a study about the control and defenses about this uh, logistic company. So the attackers learn about what kind of antivirus they're using, what kind of uh, firewall, uh, are you doing more SOC monitoring or not? The attackers spend some time really learning about the organization, right? So by the time the attacker decided to deploy a ransomware, we started to see that the ransomware was even able to uninstall whatever EDR and uh, whatever antivirus program has been deployed within the organization. So we also able to capture a script that was deleted, of course, by the hackers. And then through the digital forensic technique, we were able to recover a script that was used by the attackers. And from there, we discovered that how the attackers actually uh, write the script and then uninstall, uh, automatically uninstall all the protection on the end user's computers, which is quite, I would say, in a negative way, quite fascinating to see how hackers actually automate the entire process, right? So wherever the ransomware is moving, right? Um, the protection, the endpoint protection, the antivirus will be uninstalled by the ransomware. And then the attackers also using Active Directory through the Active Directory to spread ransomware na uh, nationwide. Because every one of the organizations, when they log into the organizations, they need to connect to the Active Directory. So when they log in, it is also the same time when the malware get deployed from the Active Directory back to the PC, right? So once the malware get deployed back to the PC, the malware will start executing the script, which is to uninstall the antivirus, uninstall whatever protection they have. So this was quite, um, quite serious because uh, almost the entire organization got compromised with uh, ransomware, 
right? So they, they're leveraging an active directory. Now, active directory is also seldomly being uh, paying attention because active directory is very noisy. If you ever administer active directory before, active directory is like a centralized server where everyone log into it, right? To get their profile, to get their policies. Active directory is a very noisy server, right? If you're doing, if, if you are the system administrator of active directory, you'll probably get tired of looking at the logs, right? So that's why typically active directory logs get ignored by administrators get ignored by, by many, many uh, software as well. So, but active directory logs are very critical. It actually tells us clues when someone is trying to attack it, right? You see, when hackers hack into the organizations, right? The first target for the hacker is to look for active directory. Where is the active directory? Because this is a one single console. If they can take over the active directory, they can take over the entire organizations already. But we seldom pay attention to the logs of active directory. That's one of the issues that we commonly see everywhere. And for this case, right, the hackers actually hacked into the logistic company for more than two years already. And then just imagine this, if someone staying in your house for more than two years, right, they quite likely know where are the things, what are the things that you, what are the equipments that you're using and uh, where to move themselves, how to move themselves, just like the movie Parasite, right? When someone already in your house already. So it's quite scary. And um, another case, uh, this one is a software house. This one just happened uh, last year. This, this software house is actually, is um, the developed software for financial institutions. Uh, in fact, this software house is a regional um, organization. So they got hacked. The way when we, to cut the story short, right, after we conducted the forensic investigation, we realized that uh, one of their VPN gateways are vulnerable. Hackers can actually use the VPN gateway to dump all the credentials uh, from the organizations, meaning that the hackers can attack the VPN. By attacking the VPN, the hackers will get a username, passwords of all of the employees of the organization. And what makes it worse was that this username and password were also used on the Active Directory. Now, this is a good example. Now, once the hackers are able to compromise the VPN, get a username and password, the hackers will actually log on to the Active Directory and start taking over the Active Directory. From taking over the Active Directory, then the hackers are also using this to spread the ransomware nation, uh, this uh, uh, company-wide. Right? So Active Directory, again, uh, be used as a tool for the hackers to uh, deploy the ransomware. So the attack was quite uh, concerning because this software company developed apps, develop uh, applications, develop software for financial institutions. Um, so it creates a, such a huge ripple effect. Uh, so the financial institutions were quite concerned because whether the software source code were exposed or not, or uh, whether anything get exposed. Eventually the hackers also decided to uh, expose some of their files uh, when they asked for ransom. Uh, so this, this case uh, was quite interesting. We also learned uh, quite a few things from, from this uh, hacking incident, right? Hackers, um, Way how they move themselves, the way how they uh, how they dump the credentials from the external devices. So, um, and uh, this is also a case where we realize that hackers nowadays also, when they deploy ransomware, they are no longer just interested to collect ransom money from you. They will also copy of make a copy of your files, right, and post your files onto the dark web. If you do not pay on time, then um, then they will release the files. Now, this used to be a very if you compare with like three, four years ago when we handle ransomware cases, right? This typically hackers will just encrypt your files and then ask you for a payment, right? But nowadays, I think most of the cases that we see already, hackers are already making a copy of a files, <clears throat> store it somewhere else and put it onto the dark web. And then if you don't pay, right? They will just expose your files. Unfortunately, this has become a norm already. Right? So this is something that we also have to uh, be aware. We need to know, nowadays we need to know how much the hacker know about us. This is something that we have never thought about before. We know that we everyone is talking about lo, uh, third party logistic attack, you know, um, third party uh, risk, but we never know how how is this how is this work. One of the fundamental concepts is that we need to know what hackers know about us. We need to know what have we been exposing in terms of digital footprint to the outside world. For example, if any of our employees' accounts get compromised already, do we know that or not? We need to ask ourselves: uh, is if is any of our files currently floating in the dark web? These kind of questions we need to ask ourselves also. So now the whole landscape today is we're no longer just looking at how secure we are. We also need to look at what do the hackers know about us that we don't know, right? So that's why we summarize everything together. 
uh, compromise assessment will give you the answer. But compromise assessment itself may not give you everything. We need to have a combination of approach in order to foster a more uh, stronger cybersecurity uh, for the organizations. Oh, at this stage, right? After you hear the three stories, like, what do you think they have in common? Right? Now, all of them, they have conduct audit, annual risk audit by the external auditors, right? mainly because they are regulated uh, customers, they are coming from regulated industries. They all have conducted uh, risk audit by external auditors. They also have antivirus deployed. They have EDR deployed. Uh, even some of the EDR may have AI function, by the way, AI function, and then uh, they still get compromised. And they have SIEM, they have logging system deployed. They have even have uh, um, managed security, managed system security, MSS, managed security services enabled. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, I think two of the organizations just now I share with you have their own MSS, another one outsourced to a third party MSS. But when everything is in place, why cyber attack can still happen? Right. This is a big question we need to ask ourselves. Um, they also conduct penetration testing every year annually. Right? Um, but what do they have in common was that when hackers hack into the organizations, the hackers stay between one to five years. And this is a scary part. You know, while we are doing our audits, while, while you know, the EDR is functioning, patching itself, uh, while all the antivirus is keeping updated, the hackers are still staying within the organizations together you know, with your employees. And this is a scary part. How, how did the hacker, hackers evade all these uh, devices, right? So the next thing is, what we're missing? Looking at the three st uh, stories that we have just mentioned, right? What was missing is that historical events, some historical events that happen, you see to us, right? To, to the technical people, an event happened is just a lot, right? Uh, maybe one or two lines of logs. But these one or two lines of logs actually means a lot to their organizations. But when you have these one or two lines of critical logs mixed together with thousands and thousands of overlogs together, then this one will be missed out. These critical clues will be missed out. So by the time when we do computer crime investigation, when we do digital forensic, then only we duck out, this is too late already. Right. So that's why we need to have a very close attention, pay close attention to our logs. And um, what we're missing also, the evaluation of detection response controls. And surprisingly, if, uh, even until recently, we, just, we were just doing a compromise assessment for one of the financial institutions. And we realized that when we do compromise assessment, we have a very different approach, by the way. We will first evaluate the existing control first. We will first evaluate how do you detect, how do you detect, how do you respond to any attack first? We will evaluate this, this part first. And true enough, when we do evaluation, we realize that these financial institutions, they deploy all the NDR, EDR. However, the NDR is not able to tell where's the source attack coming from because of the architecture limitation. And also their vendors, how the vendor also deploy the, uh, their controls. We realize that, hey, your intrusion prevention system not able to tell where the source attackers are coming from. It's only showing a proxy IP address. The proxy IP address, which is belongs to the, to the financial institution, that doesn't help, right? So there's no evaluation on control effectiveness because every time when we deploy something into our network, we thought that, okay, case stop, soft, right? Uh, we have done this, we have installed this, we have the protection. It's not as simple as that. We need to look at whether we deploy properly or not. We need to look at whether we have configured it properly or not, whether it's functioning properly or not. So this is a common issue for all the three cases that we've shown you. They have deployed everything. Everything you can think of for financial institutions, right? You have firewalls, they have uh, IPS, IDS, they have uh, EDR and at the endpoint and everything. Um, and then they have uh, something we're missing also, Active Directory, they have never done a configuration assessment and also activity analysis on Active Directory. So meaning that during the for digital forensic, we realized that the Active Directory was constantly being brute force, but nobody paid attention to it. Nobody will look at it as a sign of attack. Right, constantly bring brute force means that someone actually constantly running scripts and guess the username and password against the Active Directory. Right, it generates hundreds and hundreds of logs, but nobody actually pay attention to it. Uh, this is also something uh, quite critical. So if you have Active Directory running in your organizations, right, I think after this this presentation, the first thing you should be looking at is looking at your Active Directory. Has there been any brute force attack happen in your know, Active Directory? Has there been any flag? In fact, within your organization, we should expect to see zero, zero, uh, zero brute force attack against Active Directory. If there's even a single brute force attack, right, a single um, attack, uh, sign of brute force attack, meaning that you have seen uh, people logging through more than five, 10 times, right? It's a sign of a compromise already, I would say. 
right? So, and also blind spots, because within organizations, there are many devices that you cannot deploy EDR, you cannot deploy antivirus, but they are equally important and they can be compromised as well. Like things like print servers, your CCTV uh, systems, uh, your legacy system, AS400, um, uh, AIX, these systems could have been compromised, but we may not know. Uh, let's say the password was being shared. So these are the things that we also need to know. Uh, and none of these are being taken care of. Uh, of course, some, some, uh, some theory will say that, okay, for these kind of devices, if they compromise, we'll look at the network. Yes and no, right? But if the devices never go through a main network protection layer, and then the, there will, be any, will not be any locks to, for you, for us to look at, right? And then none of these are also being done, uh, third-party intelligence, because uh, you see, when, when these organizations, they do not do, do a third-party intelligence uh, search, right? They, they do not know what have they been exposing. This also put them in the, in the dark. And one of the organizations actually running a vulnerable VPN server, they have no idea about the vulnerability. If they have done a digital footprint about themselves, they, they would have known that the hackers are already aware that they are running a vulnerable VPN server that could have just patched it immediately already. So they have no idea what the hacker know about them. Right, so now visibility is the key. So we need to know what the hackers know, right? So, so let's go into what is compromise assessment. Now, finally, we go into the, the topic. So compromise assessment is like um, knowing what the, what is inside your infrastructure. So the common question is, what's, how different is compromise assessment against vulnerability assessment? Don't we just do vulnerability assessment and penetration testing every year already, right? Why do we still need to do compromise assessment? Right. What's the difference? Now, I would like everyone to imagine this. Imagine your, your infrastructure is your house, right? Your house, you have uh, doors, you have windows to protect intruders from coming into your organizations. You have uh, the, the way how you design your house, like you put in a fence. Uh, this is uh, your infrastructure. Now, when we talk about penetration testing and security assessment, basically, we are talking about how our doors and windows are protecting our house. Right. So we are testing on our doors, we're testing the security of our windows, we're testing the security of um, perhaps uh, we install a, we install a, a gate, right? Test, testing the gate. So this is what penetration testing about, testing the controls. However, there's a, one major question here. Is our house infested with rodents or pests, like insects or maybe rats or anything or not? Penetration testing, when looking at your doors or looking at windows, we won't be able to tell, right? We, what we need to do is we need to do an x-ray scan on the house. We need to look behind the walls. We need to look under the sink. Uh, we're no longer concerned about your windows and doors anymore. We're more interested to know things that behind the scene, like under, the, under your uh, underground or in the space between your roof and uh, your ceiling. Is there any rats hiding or any con insects right, uh, hiding or not? This is the what compromise assessment is about, right? We're no longer looking at... Um, just your controls. We're looking inside the, the servers. We're looking inside the logs. We look for clues to look for signs of compromise, to look for rats, any traces of rats or any traces for any insects already. So we are looking at different perspectives. So you can say that compromise assessment is a more in-depth overview of, about your infrastructure, right? We, with the intention of discovering any signs of compromise or any potential signs of compromise. So what are the skills needed to do compromise assessment? Now, we, based on our experience uh, in conducting digital forensic and computer crime investigation, compromise assessment is not something that we can just deploy a tool and then let the tool to do the scan. There will be a lot of manual assessment and human intelligence involved <clears throat> in order to analyze the, the, the logs and the feedback from the tools. The tools is just a tool, right? So what we would suggest is that whoever is conducting the compromise assessment in your organization for you, or maybe you engage a third party to conduct a compromise assessment for you, these people must have experience in incident response, how to deal with malware, know how, how malware behaves, and also preferably have experience in doing digital forensics. Because with this experience, we get to see even a simple line of logs, right? Or even simple clue of uh, fragments of uh, the malware. Actually, we can tell a lot of stories from, from based on these things. So preferably with people with incident response experience and also digital forensic experience, if you choose to appoint someone in-house to do it. And uh, compromise assessment is not an EDR, not, not deploying EDR tool now. We understand that the regulators, the bank has released, released a memo about compromise assessment back in May. Um, and the memo is quite well uh, written. And what we would 
like to emphasize here is this compromise assessment is not about bringing any vendors, EDR vendor into an environment. This is a very big misconception. Compromise assessment is not just about deploying EDR tools to do scanning. If it's as simple as just doing scanning, right, your EDR tool or your antivirus or your firewall would have been detected already. It wouldn't have to go through a, a separate exercise to do a discovery. Right. In fact, many vendors nowadays also claim that the tools having AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning. My advice is that do not get oversold by these features because if AI, machine learning, all of these are so effective, right? We would not have seen any, uh, any compromise cases that we continue to see even until today, right? I know that a lot of product vendors may not be happy when I say this, right? Because tools are just tools. Hackers are human. Hackers are not, not, uh, not uh, tools. Hackers are human. Human, we think of a way to bypass. And that's why in some of the cases that we have seen, uh, hackers manage to not just evade the, the EDR detection, not just evade the antivirus detection, but even uninstall, uninstall the, the antivirus and uh, the EDR from the, from the victim. So remember, compromise assessment is not about deploying EDR tools. In fact, if you look at the entire compromise assessment exercise, EDR tool scanning, we would say it just consists about maybe 40% of the, the work. The remaining 60% of the work doesn't concern EDR tool. This is what I'm going to share with you how we look at compromise assessment, assessment shortly. But this is one of the myths. Compromise assessment is about EDR. It's never about EDR. And uh, how do I select vendors? Basically, you, you can actually appoint your own staff to do it. You don't have to get a third-party vendors, uh, provided that what I mentioned earlier, if your staff has incident response experience, digital forensic, and malware analysis, that would be great. Um, so how often do we do compromise assessment? Now, based on the regulator's suggestions, large financial institutions, you have to do it, uh, you should do it annually. For non-large financial institutions, this would seem like a one-time uh, engagement. But then again, also based on what we have seen in the, in the industry right now, um, hackers do not really pick and choose anymore. Whether we are large, small, medium, uh, tiny, hackers do not really care. So we are facing this equal amount of risk as if we are the, the big guys, right? So today, hackers don't care whether we are housewife, whether we are a student, or whether we are a CEO of companies when they send a spam mail to us. The same theory applies to organization as well, right? So how do, we, how do we see compromise assessment, right? Based on our years of experience, I would like to share with you how do we look at compromise assessment. Now, we have always been doing compromise assessment uh, in our computer crime investigation cases because once the cyber attack has happened, uh, a digital forensic has been conducted, the next thing for us to do is to do threat hunting and compromise assessment because we want to make sure that whatever infrastructure has been infiltrated by the hackers and are clean. The hackers are no longer hiding in the infrastructure. That's why we carry a compromise assessment for all of our past cases. Now, that's why I say uh, when we look at compromise assessment, we look at it in a very different perspective. We look at it in a very thorough and different perspective. Normally, what we do in, in the compromise assessment exercise, what we will be doing is that we will, oops, we will be doing this first. We will assess assessing the control first. We will look at what you have and what you don't have first. And whatever you have, are they working effectively or not? Are they configured properly or not? Are they able to detect and respond to any sign of attacks or not? And why did it fail? You know, why, why did it uh, not able to detect the earlier intrusion, right? So we'll be looking at your existing control first. This is a very key critical stage that most, uh, most of us will miss out. Right. If you, you're not coming from the digital forensic background, right? most of this, most of this uh, evaluation will be missed out. So what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at a network layer, we'll be looking at the endpoint, looking at active directories, and non-computer equipment, non-computer equipment presentation layers. So non-computer equipment like your print servers, your CCTV systems that could have been compromised, could have a firmware, uh, loophole that allow people to do lateral movement. So we'll be looking at all of these controls first. Right. Looking at network layers, see whether the network NDR, your IPS, intrusion prevention systems are configured properly or not. Are they capturing the right uh, direction or are they, do they have captured enough details or not? Even come to the point of inspecting when the, whether your vendor has deployed the correct configuration settings for you or not. This is something that we'll be checking to ensure that um, everything is thorough and then the hackers can no longer hide within your organization. Now, once we have done the control evaluation, then we will decide 
whether the controls are efficient, effective or not. If the controls are ineffective or inefficient, right, then only will suggest that you deploy EDR software or you deploy NDR software. And then we will look at your environment. We will look across different brands out there in the, in the industry. Then we'll advise you which are the EDR you may be wanted to take in as a POC proof of concept, right? And then deploy in your environment and that's start to kick off the exercise. If, however, if all of the controls are effective, all our controls are working, then we'll move on straight away to perform a compromise assessment using whatever controls you have, plus the tools that and uh, the methodologies that we're having. Now, in some situations, some sometimes when we come across uh, an organization where we're performing compromise assessment, uh, compromise assessment with, some organizations may have a very fundamental EDR. And the fundamental EDR may miss out some, some features that we also can, can let them know during the controls evaluation. And this is the time that we advise them uh, to see whether they want to deploy a new EDR or deploy a certain other EDR that can cover what they are missing. Right? However, if you already have an EDR in place and you already got what supposed to have, right? we will continue to make full use of what you have. Right? This, is, this is very important because you will continue to use the same EDR. We have to make sure that you are getting 110% out of what you have invested in already. No point to bring in a third-party vendor uh, to, to deploy some software tools into your environment just because uh, you want to make a sales of a third party. And it is also very important of what we want to clarify here because um, as an assessor, as an LGMS uh, uh, assessor, we do not sell any hardware or software. We do not sell any EDR. We do not sell any uh, any form of uh, uh, so soft, uh, security solutions. We the reason for that is um, we want to remain as neutral and impartial as possible. Whichever that we are re referring to our client when it comes to our service, whether it's penetration testing or compromise assessment, we want to ensure that we are giving the fair opinion. Now, just imagine if we are carrying certain product, carrying certain solutions, we are having a close tie up with certain vendors. When we come into an environment, how neutral can we be? We can't be neutral anymore because we already have some tied up with uh, you know, some brands and some vendors. So in order to ensure that our customers re receive the most impartial and uh, most objective opinion, we will stay away from doing uh, any product sales or any solution sales. That's why for the last 16 years, you, you will not never buy uh, any software or hardware from LGMS. Now, during the compromise assessment, <clears throat> we'll be looking at several things. We'll be looking at the network layer, look at, we're looking at log inspection, we'll look at the past history, we'll look at effectiveness of the controls, we'll do even simulations if necessary to, to ensure that uh, your network control is, uh, is working. Now, also more importantly is during compromise assessment, <clears throat> We will look at any signs, any potential signs of uh, intrusion. We will even study, backtrack uh, the, the time period of, um, uh, of the project. Let's say we look at three months beforehand. Uh, for the last three months, what are the incidents happen? And then also we will look at the endpoint. We'll look at Active Directory. We'll inspect the Active Directory to see whether it's configured correctly or not, uh, whether there's any log being generated. Uh, we will look at non-computer equipments. And also we do a threat intelligence and the, uh, digital footprint search. Now, this is also very important. <clears throat> Threat intelligence and digital footprint search during a compromise assessment. Because we wanted to, we also wanted to know, does a hacker know anything about this organization or not? Has this organization has any loophole that currently being discussed by the hackers or not? We want to know this, this intelligence, right? So we will, we will do a threat intelligence and digital footprint search. Now, what, what is digital footprint? Digital footprint is like something that what the organizations have left over on the internet and on the dark web. For example, if the employees of the organizations are still using an outdated, uh, outdated laptop, for example, and then they use the outdated laptop to connect to the internet from the organization, and these kind of activities will generate a digital footprint that is valuable to the hackers. Because once the hackers see this, see this digital footprint, the hacker will know that, hey, by the way, there are some employees within these organizations are still using outdated operating system. They're using outdated Windows 7. They're also using outdated browser. I may create a malware to target on this employee later on. So we want to know that whether we are leaving out too much digital footprint on the outside world and uh, whether the hacker know about this digital footprint uh, that can become a vulnerability to us or not. So we need to know this. So during the compromise assessment, we will search for this as well, right? We look at network, endpoints, active directories, uh, non-computer equipment, <clears throat> and they will do a deep analysis and reporting. Uh, we have our own tools and script to, to carry out this, and then finally, we call it, uh, the project complete. So by the time we complete the project, we should have a very strong assurance that no one is still hiding in, inside a house already. Our house is clean, and, 
and no one should be even able to hide inside a house. Also because we also evaluated the controls earlier. We know that these controls are all fully functional, right? And uh, there's no way we can, the, the bad guys can come sneak in again and bypass. Right? So this is how we do compromise assessment. Now let's go to the regulatory guidelines. I think this is also the part that everyone will be very concerning with, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> So this is how we interpret the entire guidelines based on Bank Nicaragua's uh, memo issued in May and also the FAQ that was issued in summer in June, right? <clears throat> what should be covered inside the compromise assessment, right? Based on the guideline is the entire IT infrastructure, right? Of the production environment, uh, including network system and endpoints, right? So some, some of our uh, client prospect may ask, wait, what happened to our UAT, development, our UAT and development environment? Should I be covered? So based on the guideline, literally, we just interpret it as the production environment. Now, as long as your UAT or your development environment are not directly associating, not directly connecting to it, so I guess it's being spared, right? And I recommended to include system in overseas and subsidiaries uh, licensee, uh, meaning that if you have systems that is overseas, <clears throat> they, are, they are located overseas, and also you have subsidiaries and licenses that are connecting back to your organizations, these systems shall be covered as well. The keyword here is the uh, interconnectivity that is having between you and your licenses and, and your subsidiaries. If there's any interconnectivity, these systems should be covered. Um, and then there's also a common ask question, should we cover a disaster recovery site or not? Right. This is a very common asked question. Uh, for the compromise assessment, should we cover disaster recovery site or not? Now, disaster recovery was mentioned in the first memo in back in May. Um, however, it's mentioned under the plan. See, once we have carried out the compromise assessment, if we find any loopholes, any gaps, right, we need to formulate a plan to rectify the, the loopholes, right? So the plan is mentioned, where this is where the DR was mentioned. The plan should cover what is on the primary side and the DR side. Right, so this is what the uh, the regulators have stated uh, that the plan cover the DR side. So when you do a remediation based on the plan, you should cover the primary side and also the plan should cover the uh, disaster recovery side. <clears throat> so independence also very important. The CA can be performed by internal team who are not involved in the daily operation, who are not involved in the day-to-day -day operation. If you have a separate team, incident response team, who do not involve in the day-to-day -day monitoring, who do not involve in day-to-day -day work within the production environment, <clears throat> then these are the ideal people that can engage them with. And then team from an independent uh, reporting and governance, governing structure, okay. Uh, Third-party service provider, um, so timeline, okay, remediation period may exceed the stipulated uh, required timeline. This is also, um, it's also quite concerning. Uh, a lot of uh, financial institutions came to us and say, hey, we need to do this project. We need to completely wrap up everything by December. Uh, yes, uh, this is true. You need to uh, wrap up everything in six months time, we need, meaning that before December, you need to start to uh, conduct a compromise assessment. But if the compromise assessment have identified any gaps or any uh, loopholes that we need to rectify, the rectification period can span across, can span across uh, the years, this year. So you do not have to be too worried, right? You can span across this year. Okay, what about cloud-based services, right? Cloud-based services, how do we do? Do we, should we do compromise assessment? We host some of our emails on the cloud, right? We host some of our, um, I know we host some of our files on the, on the cloud. So should we be doing compromise assessment? We have an option here. If your cloud service provider uh, can do their compromise assessment and share the report to you, that's perfect. Uh, and also if, uh, if not, then you should be doing a risk assessment to determine how's your risk exposure, right? Uh, rising the connectivity between you and your cloud service provider. So you should be doing a risk assessment. Uh, so did that answer the question? I'm not too sure, but it has to look at, you have to look at your, um, your actual implementation. If you're just using cloud as an email, uh, your cloud provider just providing email functionality, then I would say that you just request a CA report from a cloud service provider, service providers should be surface, surface already, should be enough already, right? However, if you are doing more things with a cloud service provider, let's say you're doing some of the processing, you outsource to a hybrid cloud, cloud, right? Some of the cloud also are located locally and uh, in the different countries, you are, that is slightly more complex. We need to look at the situation and advise accordingly. And what about mobile devices? Should mobile devices be uh, part of the compromise assessment? Now, theoretically, if you ask assessor like us, I would tell you yes, because mobile devices are usually the most vulnerable uh, devices out there, right? But then again, 
what has the regulator mentioned also that uh, company issued tablet and mobile phones are expected to be included, right? So the keyword here is company issued or organization issued mobile phones and tablets. So if you if your organizations are issuing mobile phones or tablets, and this needs to be part of the scope of compromise assessment. Right, so uh, we almost come to the end of the uh, presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type in the chat box. So uh, we have our assistant, Kane, uh, Lydian, and uh, Isabel can assist. Does anyone have any questions so far? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Mahayudin from MIDF. Hi, hi, uh, my just, uh, just wonder why uh, only company device uh, included, not uh, personal device uh, being accessed to the company uh, so called whatever system. This one, uh, this company e uh, tablet, mobile phones, are you mean? Ah, uh, yes, uh, only company uh, tablet and device, not the personal, because we are also using personal device and eh, some to access. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so That's why, why this. So if you ask, ask us, right, as an assessor, I would say any devices that connects to your organization resources should be part of the compromise assessment, right? Because let's say I'm using my kid's laptop and my kid's laptop are infected with ransomware, right? And I use that to connect to back to the organizations, right? That would be a disaster already. But then again, based on the guideline, we're just taking the guidelines literally, literally based on the guidelines, right? The guidelines mentioned that company issues tablet and mobile phones. That's why this was being posted here. Yeah, because from my from my understanding, CA doesn't uh, differentiate between personnel or company, right? Uh, yeah. Device. Yeah, especially work from home right now. This work from home, and uh, we also have, you know, if we do not define a policy properly, people may be using other types of computers. Like, uh, like we have many cases like we see people using their common use computers at home to connect back to company resources, which is also a kind of risk. Also, um. If the organization do not have a strict policy to define this, right, this can become a risk. Uh, then again, this is purely based on the guidelines. So if you if we are working with you, right, we will suggest that you you include your personal devices as well, as, especially when the personal devices are used to assess. Yeah, the your re record, recorded version or uh, recorded because on miss uh, oh miss oh miss oh uh, oh later provide. Yeah. Okay, we are hearing someone. <laughs> okay, this this webinar is recorded. Uh, I'll be able to share with you uh, if needed. Right. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yes, we have questions from. Uh, Hi, uh, 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 I'm Jack here. I have one question here. I just want to know uh, for this CA exercise, right? Is there or are there any specific CA tools uh, that, I mean, uh, standardized tools used meant, uh, meant to be used for this CA purpose? Uh? For example, uh, I, I mean, just for example, for, for VA, right? Normally we use Rapid7 or Nexus, this kind of tools. Uh. So for CA purpose, are there in the market any standard or specific tool that are meant for CA exercise? Uh? Thanks. No. Oh. No, uh, the, that's, a, that's a good question, Jack, uh, because there's no one tool that can do CA. Why is that? Uh? Why is that there's no one tool that can do CA? You see, uh, when hackers compromise in an, or in an uh, architecture, right, the hackers do not just compromise endpoints. The hackers do not just compromise our computers. The hackers can compromise other things. The hackers can compromise your, uh, your logging server. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a computer. Uh. The hackers can find ways to come into organizations. Um, if we are just relying on certain tools, right? That certain tool is particularly doing testing on specific specific items. Now, as part of a compromise assessment, we also look at your history. We look at um, the way how you how you detect, and these are the things that tools cannot do. Uh, of course, I'm still using tools to do the history, but these are the areas that we need to rely on different tools, different tools to combine, and then to assess um, your level of compromise. And that example, when we do a sweep, let's say we've found, we use a threat intelligence to identify an IOC that may relate to your industry, uh, the IOC indicator for compromise that may relate to financial industry. When we get this threat intelligence 
and then we want to do a sweep right in your entire uh, organization then we may be leveraging on your edr to do the sweep or we, we may be using your ips your existing ipf ips to do the detection to set a trap to do the detection or we, maybe we even write a script to do a hunt right using this ioc to hunt for certain uh, in, in within certain network certain segment of your network to hunt for this ioc so it's um there's no one single tool that we, we, we just deploy, install, click, and then do the do the scanner. It's not as as like that, uh, the compromise assessment, because we're looking at multiple different layers. So Mr. Fong, I'm Hui Xiang from ICBC Bank. I would like to check with you what is the approach to do the CA uh, then from LGMS standpoint. Um yeah, we have just mentioned here. Um <clears throat> the approach is basically we will evaluate what you have and don't have first. Uh, what you have and don't have first, we have a very comprehensive checklist to, to tell you whether things that uh, you, you will, we will be evaluating. Uh, our checklist of 100 over items that is very comprehensive because we have been conducting compromise assessment for more than 10 years already. That's why we can tell you that some of the things that by deploying a software or tools are, is, is never able to tell you the real results. You see why our, all of these organizations who have been hacked, right? They have been hacked. Even though they have SIM, they have EDR, they have antivirus, why have they been hacked? Because there are many ways that this tool can slip through. And then there are also many ways human can make mistakes by misconfiguring, misconfiguring some of these uh, controls that hackers can still, still slip in. So the objective of a compromise assessment is to make sure that we cover all angles. We look at, is there any way that we have, may have missed out? Is there any limitation of the existing tools that we, we may have? Then we need to cover all this, identify all of this. So this is the approach that we use. Uh, if you like, then get in touch with us. We'll share with you in the more in-depth. We have a separate discussion, a separate presentation for you to go down deep into this, uh, this approach. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, I have a question here. Let me just read it out. Um, Plan must cover DR. Is this on the workaround for the remediation to the production that requires us to activate DR exercise for the specific file compromise? Or we still need to put in scope of DR servers, etc. Okay, this is regarding the disaster recovery site. Should disaster recovery site uh, be part of the compromise assessment? I cannot answer you because I am not coming from a regulator. But what I can interpret from the guidelines that's provided. In back in May, right? Disaster recovery was only mentioned as part of the plan, remediation plan. Now, whether or not disaster recovery should be part as part of a compromise assessment, uh, there's no specifically being mentioned, right? Now, the way how I see is that if we have a totally identical disaster recovery site, right? And totally identical means totally identical. So absolutely, absolutely the same. Now, if we have a totally identical disaster recovery site, what we do in the primary site should be enough to replicate over to the disaster recovery site already. That means what we have discovered at the primary site should give us some kind of assurance that whether or not we need to do a disaster recovery site. Now, if we found a lot of gaps in the primary site, then that is the time that we say, hey, by the way, uh, did we misconfigure a disaster recovery site like this also? If we yes, uh, then we should cover this disaster recovery site. But if let's say when we do a primary site, we found out oh, everything is in place, everything is tightened nicely and everything is uh, confirmed, no compromise, everything is clean. Then the question is back to the management. Okay, do we want to look at a disaster recovery site since our primary site is so solid and then we also have a 100% mimic from a, disaster, uh, from a primary site? It's a bad management decision. But however, from a guideline perspective, this was only mentioned as the remediation portion, right? So uh, meaning that when you do a fixing, the plan for fixing, what you do on the primary site should also fix on the disaster recovery site. And the question was whether of uh, the question also asked uh, this one coming from uh, Safik. Uh, the question also asked, um, you need to activate the DR exercise or not? Uh, this one is, is back to you. Whoever is doing the CA for you should have the ability to advise you uh, to, to, to tell you where, where is your level of compromise, potential level of compromise, and whether you should trigger a DR exercise or even tabletop exercise for, for a cyber drill or not. Uh, this is something your advisor should advise you. Do we have uh, other questions? Okay, I think easier is voice uh, because I'm having a very poor eyesight. <laughs> um, I have to apologize. I'm, uh, I'm looking at the chat now. It's uh, been a bit struggling. 
Uh, maybe you can use voice. Uh. Uh, Pung, uh, Jack again. Uh. Hi, Jack. Actually, I have a concern on this uh, because uh, I do not know whether the, the rest of the participants in this session, maybe you, you all could have, have the same question in mind uh, as me. Uh, okay? uh, my concern here is that because according to the Bank of Gas letter and the FAQ, uh, it did not mention any specific tools used for CA. And it also did not mention any approved security assessor to perform this CA. So if we were to engage the party or engage our internal independent team to perform this CA, how would we, I mean, how could we ensure that whether we are doing the right thing, whether we are using the right tools to, to, to I mean, to, to complete this uh, CA exercise. So this is my, my concern here. Yeah. Okay, Jack, think of this, uh, disaster recovery. Just like Sia, think of this disaster recovery. Is there one single tool that can do disaster recovery? We kind kind of hard to answer that, right? Uh, one tool to do disaster recovery, uh, one tool to do business continuity planning is is almost very abstract and impossible to find one tool or few tools. It's actually a combination of different tools that work together with a solid and proven methodologies to carry out a compromise assessment. Same as your disaster recovery. What is the correct way to do disaster recovery? There's no one single unified way that we can say that this is the way to do disaster recovery. It's only a matter of how matured is your methodologies or how matured are your approach, how proven are your uh, approach uh, to be able to do a successful disaster recovery. The same applies to compromise assessment. So I hope I can answer your question. Okay, I got what you mean, thanks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still trying to read out the, the text here, sorry, I. Where my spec? Okay, um, I'm starting from uh, this one. Uh, sorry. Uh. Maybe Lina, you can help me. Uh, <laughs> Lina, can you help me to read all the questions? Uh, sure. Yeah. I have uh, one question here from Noor Shahida. How about for outsource? Should it be included in compromise assessment? Or it should be. It could be depend on their reporting. Yeah, outsource depending. Uh, what is out being outsourced, right? Like what is mentioned in the guidelines very clearly. Uh, I also have a guideline here with me, that if your let's say you're using a cloud provider and obviously this cloud provider is an outsourced party, right? So cloud provider, you you can request them to do a CA on 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 their service, or you can if depending how you how you connect to your outsourcing partner. If there's any interconnectivity between you and your outsourcing partner, right, then you need to do a CA already. For example, if you outsource your software development to a, to a third party, right, the software development does not require to have a, the interconnectivity between your network and the outsource party, right, then it's obviously you do not need to ask them to do a CA. But if you have a constant interconnectivity between you, your network, and your, your third party, then CA is required, right? Again, I'm just reading re literally from the, from the guidelines. Huh? Right, thanks. Um, Mr. Fong, uh, the meeting will actually end in two minutes time because the limit is until 11 o'clock. Okay, okay. So, yeah. So, okay, um, for any other questions, right, I will happy to answer. Just drop us an email. Leading, could you please, please share our emails in the... Uh, sure. In the, yeah. So for here, I would like to share with everyone here since uh, everyone is here and I uh, would like to appreciate everyone for your time. So what, what we were happy to provide to you is that we were happy to share with you what is your digital footprint in the eyes of the hackers. So we will be giving out free assessment, free uh, footprint assessment for everyone here. Just You just need to drop us an email to beast at lgms.global with a subject free rating, right? We'll get in touch with you and then we will do a free rating on your digital footprint exposure. Now, again, this digital footprint exposure is not a scanning against your web website or not a scanning on your server. We're basically gathering, looking at whatever intelligence, whatever uh, footprint that you your organizations have left on the open and dark web, we'll consolidate them together and then they'll give you a rating. And this rating is quite interesting because some in there are some situations where we're able to tell that an organize, a huge organization is having a ransomware attack by just looking at this because one of their endpoints are connecting to a CNC server, a command control server. So uh, we'll be doing this uh, for all the participants here for free. So just get in touch with us. Let us know your company uh, domain name and then we'll be giving you a free rating on this. So if you have any other questions about this presentation, please feel free to write to us. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, answer the questions one by one. I should have wear this, but this doesn't look nice on, on me, uh, the, the specs. So um, 
I will be happy to answer your questions. Please send us your, 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 your inquiries through an email. Uh, Lillian, could you please, please share the email address in the... Yes, I've already shared it in the chat box. In the chat box. So mm -hmm. send to us and then we'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Right. Okay, so I guess that's all for us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.